Hey guys, this is me, Mark. I'm going to have a go at one of these unscripted or scripted <laughs> scripted things. So um, I've just written a, a blog. You can catch it over on my blog spot, um, which is a, uh, prompted by a pastoral letter that's been issued by the head of the Catholic Church in England and Wales, Cardinal Vincent Nichols. Cardinal Nichols is someone that I've been following for quite some time. Um, there's quite a lot of information on the blog about him. And I thought this was quite interesting because the there's one part of this pastoral letter that says that this synod meeting, in quotes, this synod meeting is not a referendum on the teaching of the church, which is quite a out there thing for a cardinal, a pro-Francis cardinal to say. Now, at 78, Cardinal Nichols has been in post almost three years past his retirement date now. Um, over the 10 years of Pope Francis's pontificate, he's built a bit of a reputation for accepting the resignation of Orthodox prelates imme immediately, while letting friendly prelates linger on in post. Nichols was appointed a member of the Congregation of Bishops on the 16th of December 2013 by Pope Francis. And on the 19th of February 2014, he was appointed a member of the Congregation for the Oriental Churches. So he appears to get on quite well with the Pope, seems to be in the Pope's inner circle. Nichols was Archbishop of Birmingham before being appointed Archbishop of Westminster, and he was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI in 2009. It was reported that Benedict XVI personally selected Nichols for the post after the Congregation for Bishops failed to reach a consensus. However, he was passed over for the Cardinalate, reportedly because of his continued support for some controversial masses that he was having at Soho with an LGBTQI++ background. So, and these masses were a source of grave scandal. They've been reported in uh, various outlets and people had, had moaned about them as well because they were quite political in nature. Ultimately Cardinal Nichols was called to Rome where the then head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith which was Gerhard Cardinal Muller took action to ensure that these scandalous masses stopped and this was reported in the Catholic Herald um, and they said that Archbishop Nichols actually said himself that while the masses will stop, the pastoral care of the community will continue at the Jesuit Farm Street Church in Mayfair on Sunday evenings. This was going on at Warwick Street, these, these Soho masses, and that was given to the Ordinariate as their parish. The reality of the situation was that there were so many complaints made about the scandal and so little action as usual, was forthcoming from the Archdiocese or the bishops, that the CDF felt it had no alternative but to take action. This lack of clear leadership really does seem characteristic of Nichols' tenure. However, it was rumoured that the change was one of the boxes that Cardinal Nichols had to tick before he was given his red cardinal's hat. And I've got that full story on the blog if you want to check it out. I'll probably see if I can put a link in there. Uh, in the notes down below. Cardinal Nichols supported the effort to have Catholic adoption agencies exempted from sexual orientation regulations. His position was interestingly qualified by a statement during a BBC interview that he would not oppose adoption by a gay person that was single. Mary Ann Seichart, a journalist commenting for the Times on Nichols' statements on the subject, observed that had the Catholic position been more hardline, it might have stood more of a chance. For me, again, this sums up Nichols' tenure. I've written lots of stuff about Nichols on the blog. His condemnation by the by ICSA, the, child, the uh, Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse, for putting the reputation of the church before victims. His attacks on concerned Catholics using their voice in the public sphere his support of the Maltese Directive over 
Amoris Laetitia, his pressurisation of bishops to be silent on abuse in order to protect Pope Francis, his ambiguity over second marriages and his rise to high office in the church, which is a very interesting read actually. Now, as anyone familiar with the history of the decline of the church in England and Wales would recognise, everything or a great deal of it can be traced back to one man, Derek Warlock, who was appointed Archbishop of Liverpool in February 1976. By Christmas, Warlock had produced a master plan for the Archdiocese, which was not well received by many of the senior clergy. And so Warlock launched a charm offensive on the younger clergy and Father Vincent Nichols became his young protégé alongside Father John Vernable, who was ordained in 1976 and became his private secretary right up until Warlock's death in 1996. Like his mentor, Archbishop Warlock, Cardinal Nichols spent very little time working in, in the parish environment. His Wikipedia entry gives another impression. It says that Father Nichols spent a total of 14 years in the Liverpool Archdiocese. Yeah, he did, but in fact he only spent about three or four years in the parish. He worked at the Up Holland Northern Institute and lots of different places. Um, as I say, it's all detailed on the blog. You will note that Nichols' consistent championing from that timeline, if you check out the timeline, um, of the same heterodox positions we have been dealing with since the 60s in the church in England and Wales. The same topics that are now being discussed by the Synod on Synodality, which we're looking forward to in October. However, as Cardinal Nichols has aged, some clergy have remarked to me that he seems to display genuine faith on occasions. His legacy, Cardinal Nichols' legacy, like his latest pastoral letter, is a story of never quite saying the right thing, never quite saying it clearly enough or often enough for it to actually be effective. Like so many bishops today, a legacy of trying not to upset anyone, trying to keep everyone happy and failing on all counts, while the faith around him sinks into irrelevancy. Perhaps for Nichols the success is being appointed to these offices by Pope Francis, perhaps that's what he sees as a successful tenure as Archbishop of Westminster. Perhaps it's not upsetting the government or not causing any scandal as far as he sees it. Perhaps it's walking a careful line between a safe pair of hands. His pastoral letter certainly hits all the right notes and I've got a quote here from the pastoral letter that was read out in Westminster Archdiocese at the weekend. In the last two years, Pope Francis has been calling us to be renewed in this mission he wants us to rediscover our life in the church as communion of life with God and one with another, opened, for, opened up for us through the sacraments, those outward signs of inward grace. Furthermore, he wants us to be a sacrament for the whole world, the outward sign that leads people to the inward grace of faith in Jesus Christ, known and lived with the communion of the church. Lots of Francis in there. Um, despite that, he does clearly state in his pastoral letter, and I quote, We can be clear then that this synod meeting is not an ecclesiastical UN assembly, nor a church parliament or convention, nor a referendum on the teaching of the church. In the words of Pope Francis, it is to be a grace-filled event, a process of healing guided by the Holy Spirit, setting out on a journey with the Lord always coming to meet us. This is very interesting, isn't it? Um, although everything in the pastoral letter is carefully wrapped in what the new head of the DDF, Archbishop Victor Manuel Fernandez, would call, would call the flavour of Francis, this sentence really stands out. It stands out against those like um, the Rialto of the Generals of the Synod coming up in October, Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich, who's openly stated that church teaching is false. There's also people like James Martin, who's been invited by the Pope to go, and Austin Ivory. And all these people are very progressive. So the whole synod process seems to have been set up to push a certain agenda. And certain people have been put into the synod who would seem to be arguing for um, the things that the Pope wants. 
Now, we can all point to places where the Pope has said that, he, that these things are outside the remit of the Church. Take, for example, female ordination. Pope Francis actually had it written into canon law. And yet, and yet, why are we having these discussions? Why are these things actually, like female ordination, for example, is included in the Instrumentum Laboris? So what is going on here? What is the game? Um, you can't have these things put up for debate by a synod and stack the deck with people who are pro those agendas and it and there'd be no agenda at work. You can't say that there is. It does really look like the synod's deliberations towards a more progressive outcome. It could also be an indemnity policy though. As, as retired Archbishop Dublin, Dermot at Martin, recently warned, synodal consultations could lead to frustrated expectations when people realise the process will not lead to radical change in church teaching on hot button issues like the ordination of women. I guess we'll just have to wait and see what happens. <laughs>